Hey guys, welcome back to Anthony's Tennis Hub. My name is Anthony Hirsch. Today I'm going to be predicting the top 10 for the men's side in 2024. We'll go through my top 10 from 10 to number 1. A few honorable mentions that I want to mention as well. Uh, Demonor is quite close to the top 10. Uh, he has to defend a fourth round at the Australian Open, also Acapulco in February. But he's a guy who I could presumably see at least crack the top 10. Uh, but I don't see him in the year-end top 10. Uh, I also want to mention Hugo Umber. I don't think he's going to, but the way he was playing at the end of last year, he's a very complete player, very talented. I think very scary at his best for nearly anybody. So I think that he could crack the top 10 at some point uh, if he keeps playing at this level. Uh, also, Grigor Dimitrov, uh, Dimitrov. I think he's going to have a really good year. And um, it was quite obvious. I mean, he beat Alcaraz and he beat Medvedev at the end of last year, reached the, uh, the Paris final. So he... Obviously, had a great season all year, one of his best, so hopefully he has another good season. Then also, uh, some other names. I think Zverev isn't going to have as good of a season. He fell out. Um, uh, Gachanov, I think, uh, is another guy who's pretty consistent, and uh, I think he could have a good season. We'll see. He's pretty good on all surfaces. Uh, big serve, big game, and pretty dominant when he's playing his best against a lot of players, actually. Um, then another guy I want to give a shout out to is Felix. Uh, OJ Aliasim, I think he's going to get back into the top 15 in the world actually, which is a pretty big hot take from me. I think Felix is going to have a really good season. I think a lot of people are kind of underrating Felix at this point. He had a bad season last year, but I think he can find it again. What he showed in 2022, when he was a match point up and two sets up on Medvedev at the Australian Open, when he pushed Nadal to five sets on clay courts, which should be his worst surface. I think he's a really good athlete, very skillful player, very good kind of all-court player. Obviously, the serve is his big strength. Um, some of his weaknesses, the return of serve, especially when it's not really coming at him with much pace, the second uh, second serve return. Um, he definitely has his weaknesses, but um, also his back end and just the amount of errors he can get on his back end, not being able to really figure it out on a bad day, just hitting loads of errors. But I think he's a guy who I actually quite like. And at his best, I like his mentality. Like when he saved three consecutive match points twice against Tommy Paul and Indian Wells last year. I like Felix. I think he's going to find it again. I give him top 15. I nearly want to give him top 10. Then uh, obviously Rafa Nadal. Rafa Nadal, it's a big question mark. He's not going to be seated at a lot of tournaments at the start. Um, I mean, he's coming in with protected ranking. Obviously, uh, he doesn't have a real ranking at the moment, but he's coming in with protected ranking for the tournaments. We'll see how he builds his ranking up, how many events he can play. I was highly considering adding Rafa in. I actually think Rafa... I don't know if Rafa is going to win a major, necessarily. I don't know if he's going to win number 23, but I would highly watch for him at the Olympics. I really think... That if he finds his best tennis with some uh, with a lot of match play by the time he reaches the Olympics, a lot of practice, and already having one go at Roland Garros and getting that practice in, and playing for his country at the Olympics, I reckon Nadal is somebody to watch at the Olympics. That said, Olympics doesn't count for rankings, but I would watch for Rafa at the Olympics. At number 10, I have Casper Ruud. I have Ruud finding himself back into the top 10. He actually nearly made the top 10 this year, despite a very, uh, very poor year for him, at least compared to last year. He did reach a Roland Garros final, uh, another Grand Slam final, which did help him out a lot to climb up there. But um, he uh, he got to number 11 in the world this year. Um, and I expect him to go one spot higher. Uh, I'm actually a person who's very high on Casper Ruud. Um, I think in terms of consistency, even though he hasn't won a title, a big title, a title at a big event, he's actually been incredibly consistent. He's reached at least a semifinal stage at, I believe, over half of the uh, big tournaments, which is incredible, an incredibly good achievement, which shows a lot of consistency. Um, I think, for example, at Roland Garros this year, he was playing at, I think, a top three level. Um, he doesn't hit, he's not like the fastest hitter around. He doesn't have the biggest serve at all. But I think, I actually think he's a very talented guy, despite not always being the most flashiest, but he's very creative on the court. He often hits a lot of shots that a lot of players don't hit. And, um, I think it takes a lot of talent to play the way he does, especially when he plays at his best, like against OJ Aliasim at Canada last year, where he beat FAA, I think like 6-2, 6-1. That was when Felix was close to his best. 
And um, it's those kind of performances that really show you how well Casper can play at his best. And he showed some variety as well, especially last year, um, getting it done on incredibly quick indoors, getting to a final, beating Fritz, beating FAA, beating Rublev uh, on route, and then beating Zverev in Miami. Um, and then getting to two Grand Slam finals, three three Grand Slam finals now, I, I think that says something about a player, especially on clay. But all around, I think he can play some great tennis. So I gave Casper the nod for number 10. I wanted to put him in there. Um, number nine is another player that I think is, is, is not really in form right now. And I think a lot of people wouldn't have him on their top 10 list. But I wanted to give him the nod. I think he's going to have a good season and a better season. His name is Taylor Fritz at number nine. And Fritz was actually one of the more winning players on the ATP tour this year. Like in terms of just pure how many ATP wins he got, I believe he was in the top six or seven for the most wins. Um, he just, the second half of the year, he definitely, uh, he definitely was losing a lot of matches. He shouldn't have been losing a lot of close matches, like against Hoffman at Wimbledon, I believe, or sorry, uh, excuse me, against Hoffman, he won in five sets, but uh, against Mikhail Emer. He, uh, he lost from up two sets to love. So that was, uh, that was a bad loss for Taylor. Um, a few losses like that. I mean, up until Monte Carlo from around Australian Open, uh, from after Australian Open to about Monte Carlo, he actually had a great little season there last year, but after that, it kind of went off the rails. He did get a title in Atlanta. I believe he got a title in Delray Beach as well, um, in February, but, not the greatest season for Taylor, but I think this, I think Taylor has actually a very good mentality. He's a, it seems like a very genuine kind of, kind of guy, very introspecting. He works very, very hard, very hard, uh, very hard on himself. Uh, he started off, he wasn't the quickest guy around. He even improved his speed, which is really the hardest thing to improve in tennis is how quickly you're moving around on the court. You either kind of have it or you don't. Um, but Fritz really improved that part of his game. And uh, he works hard out there. Big serve, big forehand. Um, the back end is something that needs a lot of improvement. The net play. But I think I think this is a guy who I think is actually quite skillful as well. And I do like his mentality. So I wanted to give the nod to Taylor. I think he'll do well. Um, and he even performed pretty well on clay this year. So I think he can do it on all three surfaces. Uh, at number eight, I have Andre Rublev. He had, in my opinion, his best year this year, despite ending it rather poorly, uh, despite a very good showing in Paris. He uh, didn't perform particularly well at uh, at the ATP Finals. But I think, uh, I mean, this is a guy that people always say is going to fall out of the top 10. He never seems to. He's very, very consistent. Is Andre Rublev. You usually like to say the guys who play a little bit more of a grindy style to say that they might be the more consistent, perhaps. But Rublev is so consistent um, in matches, uh, in points, in rallies, but also just as a player. Just ve- one of the... Uh, just consistently high level and too good for most players on tour, even if he do- isn't usually able to beat an Alcaraz or a Djokovic, etc. So I wanted to give the nod to Andre. He's also very, very even across all surfaces. You can put him anywhere. He'll just do the Andre Rublev thing. Uh, at number seven, I have Stefano Tsitsipas. Um, pretty much speaks for, him, uh, for itself. He's been in the top 10 since early 2019. I don't expect him to fall out. Um, he had a relatively poor year since the Australian Open final for the most part, at least for him. Uh, both the last two years before this, he won a title in Monte Carlo, which was a great title for him. Um, he did win a title in Los Cabos, which was his first title in over a year. So that was good for him. He's, he also had a little bit better form towards the end of the year. He played a really tight match against Medvedev. Um, I remember as well, which was showed a much better uh, level towards the end of the year. But overall, I think uh, it wasn't his best year, but I think he's going to improve. He's still a very big talent. I think I like him a lot on clay courts, especially at Roland Garros. I'd love to see him have a run there, but uh, we'll see what all happens. Speaking of people who I like on clay and at Roland Garros, number six is Holger Runa, who I, I think clay is his best surface. He reached two clay masters finals this year. And, um, I think uh, Runa is a guy that needs to improve on physicality, on a shot selection. He's only 20. He's got loads of time. Uh, I think he's shown that he has one of the higher peaks on the tour in terms of level, that he deserves to be in the top five, six players in the world. I don't see why he isn't able to do that, even on grass sports, now that he has a little bit more experience. Absolutely, he should be good on grass sports. Um, 
We'll see if in 2024 his ceiling is as high as Sinner Algaraz, but at least I, I expect him to be around number six. He also was playing better in Paris, also in Basel. He has partnership with Boris Becker. Um, he got uh, Severin Luthi, who who worked with uh, with Federer as well. He's getting even he's not getting coaches that worked with countless players like Paul Anko and Darren Cahill and seem to be extremely su- successful. He's work, he's getting coaches that have worked with the best of the best, which is the big three. At number five, this is a surprising name. I have Hubert Hercatch. I think Hercatch cracks the top five, and I think he has an extremely good season. Um, Hercatch, for the first about half of this year, he really didn't have that good of a season. He played a lot of tiebreakers, which is not always ideal because tiebreakers can kind of go either way, very fine, tiny margins. Um... But, uh, listen, Hercatch is a guy who I think is actually pretty talented. Like, if you look at his highlight reel, just the Hubert Hercatch highlight reel, it's actually very, very good. He's got great hands. He's got a great net play. He's got a solid backhand. Obviously, the forehand is the big weakness, among some other things. But very solid player. And I think on grass courts, he could, have, he could go for a big run. I think he could go for a big run on grass courts. On hard courts, quite good as well. Um, and he seems to be a guy who is inc- an incredibly good competitor and very fearless. Yeah, I mean, you can put him in a match against Djokovic, against the doll. It doesn't matter. He'll, he'll, he, it, he won't look nervous. He'll, he'll just be competing the same way. And I think there's something important about that. And I think people kind of underrate him in that way, but very fearless competitor. And, uh, I, I like her catch. I think he's, um, one of the better competitors on the tour and his serve is just insane. And I think he could have a couple more good runs. Two master titles definitely mean something. And uh, both of his runs were difficult, uh, especially his first run in Miami. was very difficult a couple of years ago. Uh, speaking of his run in Miami a couple of years ago, the person who beat in the final is my number four spot. That's Yannick Sinner. I think he stays in the same spot. Does Yannick, which would be okay. Last year was, the, or this year, sorry. This year was one of his best, uh, was by far his best year on tour, I should say. Um, he performed very, very well. He's got three other players that he's playing with, Medvedev, Djokovic, and Alcaraz, who are playing amazing. My goals for Yannick would be to defend his ranking, to get to a major final would be absolutely a goal, and uh, definitely to win another Masters title, preferably two Masters titles. I think those are very good goals for Sinner. And um, certainly, at least, Yannick talks about... Um, playing in such a way that even if he's losing, he's doing generally good steps forward for his career as a whole. I think that's important in the majors next year for the physical aspect and for the majors for him to be able to do better going deeper in best of five, uh, best of five format. I really like him at majors anyway. I mean, he's shown an incredible level at majors just once he improves on that physical aspect. Some of the matches he's played like the uh, match against Alcaraz at the US Open, he's shown an incredibly good level. And, um, listen, he's got, he's, before he turned 21, or sorry, before he turned 22, he got to the fourth round of every single major twice across all three surfaces. That is a very important stat for consistency for when he keeps improving his level. That's a very big stat for Yannick. And I think, I mean, the run he went on at the end of the year, I don't know if he wins a major, but he could. I do think he needs to improve in the best of five format. I hope he uses Australian Open, Roland Garros, for example, maybe even Wimbledon as kind of steps to do better and better. And by Wimbledon, US Open, I, uh, it would be great to see him at least reach a final at two tournaments he's done well before. And, um, and if not a final, then, uh, and, even better than a final would be to get a title, but we'll see what Yannick can do. Then at number three, I have Daniil Medvedev. I am not underrating Medvedev. I am extremely high on Medvedev. What he did this year to figure out all three surfaces was fantastic. He just brought his own same game, same level everywhere. He does have issues now that Yannick and Carlos are really on him in a head-to-head standpoint. Uh, also, Djokovic beat him quite easy or... Djokovic beat him in straight sets, I should say. It wasn't easy, but beat him in straight sets at the U.S. Open. So head-to-head standpoints, not very good for Medvedev at the moment. But I still like Medvedev a lot. And I think I think he can beat the other guys. He showed that against Alcaraz at the U.S. Open, that even Alcaraz, he can beat if he plays his absolute best, which is just scary. Scary level, despite being a bit more of a defensive player. Um, so... I think that Medvedev is going to have a very good year. And dare I say, I think he might win another hardcourt major. We'll see what happens, but I, I think Medvedev, um, this year was scary and, uh, 
For a lot of this year, he won over 80% of his matches. He went on a 19-match win streak. He even got to the final of Indian Wells, which he used to hate. He <laughs> said it's not even hardcore. So um, Medvedev was scary this year. I think he's going to have a good year next year as well. Um, number two, I've got Novak Djokovic. I do not think Djokovic is going to be year-end number one again. Djokovic already has by quite a good distance to record now, I think. I think with his eighth uh, year on number one is already two ahead of two ahead of Sampras. Um, I don't think he gets his ninth, and part of the reason isn't even. I don't even know if it's all that much to do with um, Novak going down in level. Although I think he will from twenty twenty three. I don't think twi to say that I don't think twenty twenty four will be as good of a year for Novak as twenty twenty three because twenty twenty three was so insane and. Three, the three times that Novak has won three out of the four majors, two of those years, he won only one major the year after. The other year was 2016, which is really when his height at the top of the sport kind of dipped up until two years later at Wimbledon, uh, where he won that epic against Rafa, then beat Query to start winning, start winning majors again on his comeback in his 30s. Um, but... Uh, 2016, he only won one title in the last seven months of the year. Uh, and like I said, it was kind of his downfall at the top of the sport for a little bit, or, or the start of it. <clears throat> so I think that Novak uh, isn't gonna isn't necessarily going to have as good of a year as 2023. And uh, also Alcaraz, Sinner, Medvedev are only improving, especially Alcaraz and Sinner. Um so I think uh, that the fact that he won't have as good of a year as uh, as 2023 uh, is part of it. But I also think that he just might not play as many events as usual. He's going to be 37 years old, which by uh, by the time he plays the U.S. Open, uh, he would be the oldest Grand Slam champion ever of anybody. Ken Rosewall currently holds the record. Um, Federer is still number two for the oldest Grand Slam champion. If Rafa wins any major next year, he already gets the record for the oldest Grand Slam winner. Uh, if Novak wins the U.S. Open next year, then he gets the record. Um, and if Novak wins the Australian Open next year, he takes the record for the second oldest Grand Slam winner and passes Federer. But uh, we'll see how Novak can do. Uh, age doesn't stop. Mother Nature doesn't stop. But he is, by miles, the best 36-year-old ever, you would probably have to say, or at least by miles have the best season a 36-year-old ever had with winning four out of the five biggest events and being as dominant as he was winning so many of those finals and straight sets or winning all four of those finals and straight sets. So I just think the fact that he might not play as many events, especially next year with the Olympics as well, and kind of be a little bit smarter with the schedule, he might not even prioritize the ranking as much, especially now that he's passed 400 weeks at number one. He's passed Steffi. He's certainly passed Federer, who's at 310, who used to be number one for the most weeks at number one. He's kind of already up there. He might have his full, full focus on the slams and the Olympics. Um, and then number one, I've got Carlos Alcaraz. Figure that out from what the other names were. I think Alcaraz is going to have a really, really good season. Um, I think that uh, up until kind of October this year, he, or September, October, he was in very, very good form. He was 47-4 and post-Wimbledon, which is an all-time good record for the first seven or so months of the year. Uh, and then almost won in Cincinnati as well, um, but uh, lost to Djokovic in an epic. But he kind of had problems towards the end of the year last year as well, kind of the same things repeated. I think with his team, he'll probably work hard now to have a better last few months of the season now they've seen that's a recurring issue. So I think he'll have a better way there, and I think he's going to win a lot of titles. I think I think Alcaraz is going to win a lot of titles and be very winning next year. I don't see a reason for him not to. He's... He's clearly shown his level, and I'm not very much worried about Carlos at all um, with the kind of mentality that he's shown and how much, how many different tools he has at his utility. He's still very young, inexperienced. It's actually good for him to have these kind of difficulties and obstacles. He only learns from it. He's on his own journey, but listen, he's the best, one of the most complete 20-year-olds we've ever seen, and I think that next year there's no reason to doubt that he's going to have a very good season. So that was my year-end top 10 for the men's side. Uh, Rude, Fritz, Rublev, Tsitsipas, Runa, Herkatch, Sinner, Medvedev, Djokovic, Algras. That is my top 10.
Hopefully you guys enjoyed. I've got a lot more stuff coming on this channel. I've got my men's matches of the year coming out on Friday. So hopefully you guys tune in for that. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new. There's a lot of stuff coming up. So I will see you guys at the next video.